from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez, and this is From the South. We begin with Syria, where an attack from the U.S. and its allies looks imminent. Just minutes ago, U.S. President Donald Trump warned Russia of a missile attack on Syria in response to an alleged chemical attack in the town of Duma during the weekend. Democrats, all, just about all. In a series of early morning tweets, Trump responded to Russia's promise to shoot down any missiles fired at Syria and possibly target their launch sites. Get ready, Russia, he wrote. They will be coming, nice, new, and smart. He went on, our relationship with Russia is worse than now than it has ever been, and that includes the Cold War. There's no reason for this. Russia needs us to help with their economy, and we need all nations to work together. Stop the arm race. Earlier, we spoke with US author, journalist, and blogger Max Blumenthal, who is closely monitoring the situation in Syria, and he explained the possible consequences. And every time that we see the Syrian army, the Syrian government advancing and liberating these major areas from insurgent groups backed by foreign powers, there is an allegation of chemical weapons use. We recently saw it in last year, about a year ago, in Khan Sheikhoun and Al-Qaeda occupied Idlib, and now we see it again in Douma by the Army of Islam. No evidence was provided except for photographs disseminated by the U.S., U.K., and Qatari-backed group, the White Helmets. We also saw the Syrian American Medical Society make a claim of chemical weapons use. This is another group backed by the United States. These are not credible sources. These are groups that work hand in glove with jihadists inside Syria. And on the basis of those claims, we are on the verge of war. We stand on the verge of another disastrous regime change war. Uh, in this case, though, we are going to probably see an OPCW organization for the protection of chemical, for the prevention of chemical weapons investigation on the ground. Because the Syrian army and the Syrian government have retaken Douma, they can guarantee the safety of those investigators. There has been no investigation from the ground on the alleged chemical attack that took place a year ago in Al-Qaeda-controlled Idlib which triggered U.S. military action. And so I think, you know, the public really needs to start asking questions because all of the claims, the key substantial claims in Russiagate, in the Skripal case, have fallen apart. And I think uh, if we could see a real investigation on the ground in Syria, I think a lot of those who are issuing skepticism will be vindicated. Despite the civil war that has shaken Syria for seven years, the country is trying to get back to normal thanks to the Syrian army advances against rebel groups. However, this relative peace could be broken again if a foreign intervention takes place. Our correspondent in Damascus, Hisham Wanus, tells us how Syrians feel about this new threat. In Syria, and in Syria, despite the fight between the Syrian army and different terrorist groups throughout the country, there is a worry calmness. The Syrian people want a decision from the UN Security Council on the creation of an independent body to investigate the alleged chemical attack in the city of Douma. Syrians are also concerned about the threat from the US and its allies the United Kingdom and France to attack the country on the pretext of chemical weapons. Everyone in Syria, around 22 million people, think that this aggression is going to occur. But they also say they have no fear, as they know the U.S. cannot defeat our resilience nor the capacity of our army to succeed. We are already used to these threats that happen every time our army achieves an important victory in its anti-terrorist fight. The Western powers in the Security Council have been trying to destroy our country ever since the crisis began eight years ago.
Despite their concerns, Syrian people try to go on with their lives. They are confident that the Syrian army, along with its Russian and Iranian allies, will be able to face any foreign intervention that would attack their sovereignty and territorial integrity. If we are attacked, the first country to suffer will be Israel, the Zionists, because they are the ones, along with their Western allies, that are trying to defeat Syria. But our army has defeated terrorism and will defeat Trump and will make his plans to fail. Damascus has dismissed Western accusations that it carried out a chemical attack against the civil population in the city of Duma, a suburb of Ghouta, east of the capital city Damascus. The Syrian government has invited the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons to go on a fact-finding mission in Duma. Syria says the U.S., France, and the United Kingdom are simply looking for an excuse to attack the country, and it warns that together with Russia and Iran, it will not allow the West to make Syria a new Libya or Iraq. That was Hisham Wanus from Damascus. Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro confirmed that he will not attend the Summit of the Americas, taking place in Lima, Peru, on April 13th and 14th. Maduro said he prefers to remain in the country with his people. He lamented the attitude of the Peruvian government that withdrew his invitation in February. He added, the summit is a waste of time, that it is not focusing on topics of interest for Venezuela and that the government of Peru is not assuring the minimum security for the Venezuelan delegation. I have decided I am not going to the Summit of the Americas in Lima. I am going to stay with the people of Venezuela on the 13th and the 14th, where we commemorate the defeat of the coup of 2002. I am staying in Venezuela. That's my decision. U.S. President Donald Trump has also canceled his trip to the Summit of the Americas. The White House confirmed he will not travel to Colombia either, as he had planned. Peru's President Martin Vizcarra said he was sad that Trump wasn't coming, but was reassured that Vice President Mike Pence would attend instead. We regret Trump's decision not to attend the Summit of the Americas. I think his presence would have been very important. Nonetheless, Vice President Mike Pence will be replacing him. That means the United States ratifies the importance of the summit. Even though the president will not be attending the summit, the United States will be participating, meaning that all the deals discussed in the summit will be supported by the U.S., since it's a very important country. And with less than two months until Venezuela's presidential election, the country's National Electoral Council is busy implementing various measures ahead of the big day. Freddie Gillingham has the latest. Representatives from both government and opposition parties are complying with all instructions ahead of the elections. They sat side by side at the CNE headquarters in Caracas to form a high-level group which will monitor the electoral process. The group, which will comprise of members from different parties, must be formed as part of constitutional guarantees agreement signed by presidential candidates on March 2nd. Ideally, it will force all sides of the political spectrum to work together on any issues which may arise in the electoral process. We know of a sector of the Venezuelan opposition that seeks to delegitimize the CNE and the 20th May elections. And to confront all this, it is necessary that the articulation of the democratic sectors drive this process as a way to resolve the differences that the Venezuelan society is experiencing. However, despite these efforts, foreign condemnation grows. Argentina's president, Mauricio Macri, joined a growing band of countries accusing Venezuela of fraudulent elections before they have even taken place. We are not going to validate the electoral result of May 20th or whatever date it is, because that election has no worth. However much Maduro insults me, we are not going to recognize him as a democratic president because there has been no democracy in Venezuela for a long time. Despite this, some of Venezuela's political parties still believe in the democratic path. 
even if the US and their allies don't believe them. Freddie Gillingham, Telesaur, Caracas. In Argentina, lawmakers have opened the first hearings in a historic debate to legalize abortion. The bill that could allow, this bill could allow women to terminate a pregnancy within the first 14 weeks. Thousands of demonstrators took to the streets of Buenos Aires and those in favor of legalization wore green bandanas and waved pro-abortion signs, while those opposed waved red flags and red balloons. On the first day of the debate, doctors, lawyers, religious people and human rights advocates presented their views. More than a thousand experts will make their cases by May. This is a public health issue. There has stark statistics of women dying, thousands and thousands of women dying every year from unsafe abortions. We'll take a short break now, but join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. The families of the three kidnapped staff from the Comercio newspaper have met Ecuadorian President Lenin Moreno to demand urgent action to have their loved ones back unharmed. Denise Herrera has the story from Quito. Ecuadorian President Lenin Moreno told the families of the journalists kidnapped near the border with Colombia that his government is determined to bring them back safely. His Minister of Defense and Interior joined him at the meeting. We're going to combat drug trafficking, kidnapping, crime, and we want to do it in a smart way, taking care of emotional and physical integrity and health of our brothers. The families of journalists Javier Ortega, photographer Paul Rivas and driver Efraín Segarra say the Colombian authorities must do more to help. We reject kidnapping in our country and we ask Colombia's government as brothers for bigger participation in these issues. Outside the presidential palace, journalists and students express their support for the families of the journalists and demand an urgent measures to guarantee their safety. We will mobilize every day with our students, employees and partners. We won't allow this situation to be forgotten. The family also delivered an open letter to the foreign minister, calling on the Colombian government to secure the release of the workers. They say they will continue to organize meetings to ensure the situation is not forgotten. Denise Herrera, Telesur, Quito, Ecuador. In Mexico, a group from the migrant caravan traveling from Central America visited the Senate on Tuesday. Most of them come from El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras. They explained to Mexican senators how leaving was their best choice amid the turmoil in their home countries. They also called on Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto to fight for their rights. The migrant delegation visited the Senate following an invitation from Mexico's Workers' Party. 
It is very difficult, especially for our children that we are bringing with us on this journey. They don't deserve to be put through this, but we are making a sacrifice to fight this fight for them, to take them to the United States so they don't have to live in the situation that is taking place in our country, so they can grow up and not see all that. Chile President Sebastián Piñera's proposal to toughen immigration rules has caused outrage among pro-migrant social movements. The proposed measures are seen as discriminatory and racist because they will make it harder for Haitian migrants to stay while making it easier for Venezuelans. The new rules state that those entering the country as tourists will no longer be able to change their status. The controversial bill will go to Congress for discussion. This decision is about racism and discrimination. In my view, the government is making a very unfair move. We cannot link migration with crime. We cannot stay in this mindset that it's back to the 70s. We are going back to the darkest days of the Chilean democracy. The spiritual leader of the Mapuche people, Machi Celestino Cordova, has spent 87 days on hunger strike and the state of his health is critical. They camp outside the Temuco prison, where their leader, Machi Celestino Córdoba, has spent 87 days on hunger strike. He's demanding a permit to visit his spiritual homeland, a request that has been systematically denied. Following the government's latest refusal, we want to say that the health of the Machi is not negotiable. We are demanding his basic human right, the right to exercise the spiritually of the Likud Machi and all the Mapuche people. We believe that denying him this possibility is an act of torture because it has led to him suffering and going on hunger strike. The Machi Celestino is accused of carrying out an incendiary attack against the landowners, Luch Singer Mackay, and is being held under an anti-terrorism law. However, the evidence has not been conclusive. He has been in prison for five years, a period in which he has not been able to renew his spiritual commitment a protected right in Convention 169 of the International Labor Organization. Even if you are in prison, you should be able to exercise your cultural rights. You should be able to exercise your cultural role, which is to be a machi. And that is precisely what is forbidden. And in this particular case, the withholding of that right is like a progressive death sentence. The Rejue, or sacred altar, is the spiritual center of the Mapuche world and is used in many Mapuche ceremonies the Machi must go there once a year to renew his energy, an ancestral practice that is directly linked to the vital health of the Machi. I just need 48 hours to be able to go to renew my spiritual commitment within the community at Chicago and Coco, to be able to renew my spiritual balance in my health. I am appealing for this, but I have been asking for five years, using the proper legal channels in a transparent and respectful way, and it has not been granted. The medical specialists of the Intercultural Hospital in Araucanía have noted the delicate state of health of Machi Celestino Córdoba. However, the government has not given signs that they will allow him to attend this ancestral ceremony. Cuba is introducing new measures to strengthen the private sector. Many new businesses have opened, especially in the catering industry, and the government is making it easier for them to access wholesale products. This is Cuba, a country that is working to build a stronger economy. Since 2011, the island has sought to update its economic and social model. They call it an alignment of the policies of the party and the revolution. The first step was for gastronomy companies. This will later spread to other production and non-government entities. This is a long-awaited change in response to the requests of non-governmental projects. 26 of the 59 non-agricultural catering cooperatives now operating in Havana already buy their supplies at this wholesale food market in the capital, Mercaval. This is one way the authorities have responded to the demands of the private sector. It is a first step towards enabling them to buy products they need in bulk outside of the normal popular markets. 
Merkabal has been very important because we didn't have these offers before. They even help us get drinks, cookies and more things to support our plans so that we can sell and pay off the loans we used to repair our shops. New hotels and other new buildings, newly opened cafes and restaurants and cruise ships can be seen around the city. Foreign investment is one of the priorities to make Cuba's economy stronger. This is a long-term plan, and one of the Cuban economy's weaknesses has been a lack of long-term vision when starting projects or reforms. We talk about currency and exchange duality which is a serious issue around the Cuban economy. Today we talk about other changes in Cuban public industry and businesses. President Raul Castro said it himself at the recent fifth plenary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. We must face problems without hesitation from the first moment, not wait for the solutions to come from above and contribute with creative and rational ideas. Laura Prada, Telesur La Habana. We'll take another short break, but join us after another look at what a multimedia team is reporting. Welcome back. Facebook chief executive Mark Zuckerberg has testified before Congress saying that he does not believe his company is a monopoly. Facebook faces a growing crisis of confidence among users, advertisers, employees and investors after admitting that up to 87 million people have had their personal information harvested by Cambridge Analytica, a political consultancy company. Ahead of his hearing at the Senate, an army of 100 life-size Mark Zuckerberg cardboard cutouts stood on the Capitol lawn in Washington, D.C. The cutouts had black t-shirts reading, Fix Fake Book. The display was organized by a global advocacy group, Avas, with a goal to call attention to the hundreds of millions of fake accounts still spreading disinformation on Facebook. A military plane has crashed in Algeria, killing hundreds of people. Here's more on that and other stories making headlines from around the world. Any, um, more than 250 people have been killed in Algeria after a military plane crashed near Bofarig Air Base near the capital Algiers. The defense plane was carrying scores of military troops and was heading to the western Algerian city of Bechar. Local media have said the death toll could increase. Around 80 people have died and more than 100 are in critical condition after drinking bootleg liquor in different provinces of Indonesia. 
The local police say the alcohol consisted of toxic methanol. Seven suspects have been arrested. Deaths from spurious liquor consumption is frequently reported in the country. This bootleg liquor kills a lot of people. 31 people died in Jakarta, 51 victims in West Java province, and I'm sure there are still many in other places. This is an insane situation. The United States has removed its six-month ban on visitors and immigrants from Central African country, Chad. The U.S. President Donald Trump says that Chad has met key security requirements for vetting travelers. Chad has welcomed the news. Trump announced the travel ban in 2017, mainly targeting Muslim-majority nations. The ban still includes two Muslim-majority African countries, Libya and Somalia, along with Iran, Syria and Yemen. The Israeli-Gaza border has become a stage for a Palestinian parkour team to put on a special show. It will take place in that very same spot where Israeli forces killed 31 Palestinians the week before last. Through their acrobatic moves, the Palestinians parkour for performers want to send a message to Israel that one day all Palestinians will be able to return to their land to freely practice their favorite sport. Gazans have set up tents along the border with Israel as part of the Great March of Return. The Asian city of Ayutthaya in Thailand is celebrating the Songkran Water Festival. Let's have a look at who is enjoying this festival. It's the elephants splashing waters on the people. In return, men and women are seen exploring water back at the animals. Elephants painted with flowers from trunk to toe are one of the main attractions of the celebration. Thailand is not the only country to celebrate this event. Also Myanmar, Laos and Cambodia observe this colorful festival. And with this, we've come to the end of this news free. But there's many other stories. You can find them on our website, telesurtv.net slash English. And you can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.